As I was just introduced, my name is Rebecca and I'm the co-founder and director of Pixels. For people not familiar with Pixels, we organize a variety of activities from making your first game to workshops like this, um, career development for experienced professionals who find themselves stuck, and a bunch more things. Our goals as a community organization is to lift up and empower um, game developers, especially those who are underrepresented. So I'm excited to kick off this first collaboration of our diversity, equity, and inclusion speaker series with a talk on accessibility. Accessibility is not about making games easy, nor, it is, nor is it about sacrificing creative vision. Game accessibility is about giving more people the ability to play, love, and be moved by the games we make. So without further ado, may I introduce two wonderful senior UI artists, Justine Raymond, and Kat Dolan at Proletariat Inc, who will be going over best practices for making game menus accessible, readable, and optimized for a diverse audience across many platforms. Thanks. <laughs> this sounds awesome. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, very interesting quarantine Zoom presentation. Normally, we'd be in front of a group of people, which is a little bit of an adjustment here. So thank you for dealing with a new platform and dealing with a new medium to get talks, but at least as we've seen in chat, there's folks from all over. So we can pull people from all across the globe to this presentation. So that's really exciting. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Um, so we got a brief introduction here, uh, but who are we? Uh, Kat, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, so hi, I'm Kat. <laughs> um, I uh, started my career designing software and UI outside of games, actually. I started in e-commerce, um, education, and sports betting, but moved into mo mobile games from there and now work cross-platform. I love mixing art and science so much, so naturally UI was a, a um, quick natural path for me uh, as it requires balancing visuals with uh, very measured usability. Awesome. Uh, I'm Justine. I am also a senior UI artist. Both of us work on Spellbreak, which is super awesome. It's a very new game, uh, but we've been around a long time and it's a really cool experience. I actually have a background in art direction and illustration. Um, so I've kind of done everything in games. I've, I've worked in indies for a really long time um, and I've kind of done every role of the pipeline basically. So I ended up settling on UI because I love that same challenge of mixing, you know, uh, the technical side with the creative side uh, because there's a lot of unexplored territory there. And it's always really cool to see where UI takes us and what things are changing every day. Um, I'm really quirky and I love a lot of silly things, but I love using a lot of colors. Um, I really love cats as we were talking about earlier. There's currently four cats in my house uh, and I really love coffee, but um, I'm also somebody who strives to make sure that we're advocating for a more diverse uh, group and a more diverse industry. Games is one of the most notorious with a lot of unfortunate things happening. So I've been really dedicating myself to the last few years to really pushing for a more accessible and a more friendly environment to hopefully inspire the up and coming generations and the people who are still here to stick it out and really work for a really cool future in games. So overall, um, accessibility can mean so many things. It's, it's a really big catch-all. So when you're thinking and even approaching uh, designing your game menus, this can target people who have maybe never made a game menu before, but it's also here to help people who have made game menus and aren't quite sure what are the things that we should be thinking about. So overall, when you're considering your menus, um, this is what you should really be thinking about when you're designing and when you sit down or when you even go to improve your menus your audience, right? So this seems pretty obvious, but who are the people that are playing your game? Um, understanding who is playing them and what they need to have a good experience is the key foundation uh, to understanding where you should even start and what things you should think about when you're building your menus. So you should design for people who are young, old, power users, casual users, and those who just enjoy a quality experience. Uh, this is a quote from Jesse Hauser on Medium. And it kind of highlights that it's kind of a tall order to fill. Um, you have to design for everybody. And it can be really intimidating to think about all the different types of people that will enjoy your game and that really like your game. Um, so by accommodating as many people as possible, uh, you really have the chance to make something that's really special and really easy to use for a lot of different people. Uh, so we're focusing mostly on making things accessible for those with disabilities. So here's a quick snapshot of some statistics that honestly shocked me when I found these out when I was making this presentation. 
one in 12 men experience color blindness. That is a huge percentage of people. Uh, so that's just, that just blew my mind when I found out that many men ex experienced that. Um, one in 200 women also experience some form of color blindness. That's again, a huge number. Uh, that's again, one in a couple thousand, right? So just seeing the sheer number of people that are actually susceptible to this when they're using games is incredible. Uh, 300 million people have some form of it, uh, which again, whew, huge. <laughs> that's like so many, people. Um, and then one in 30 have low vision. So this can mean anything from folks who are blind to those who just need glasses. Uh, so that's a gigantic, staggering number of people who also can't quite see well in menus. 46 million people uh, that are gamers in the United States have some sort of disability. Uh, so this can be anything from a motor disability to a uh, hearing disability, anything that prevents them from experiencing the game in the same way. Um, so this is a this is a quote from Able Gamers, which is a charity that actually helps people with disabilities make custom gaming setups uh, that allows people who maybe can't necessarily use a controller in the same way that the majority of users do and supports them in making assistive technology. Uh, so this is a really huge underserved group of people uh, that I think we're just now starting to tailor our games to and our experiences to. So how do you support your audience? There's a lot to think about there um, and you wanna support as much of your audience as humanly possible. Um, so there are a lot of areas we can focus on to improve accessibility in our games. Some important ones that we'll go over today, obviously we can't cover everything, but here are some big ones. Um, type, so making sure that your text is really legible, as well as language support for localized text and how to design for that. Vision for those with colorblindness and low vision. Hearing, for the deaf and those who are hard, who are hard of hearing, um, and motor for game gamers with mo motor disabilities. Um, as a disclaimer, this presentation doesn't answer everything. Accessibility is a huge topic. Um, it serves more as an introduction to a wide range of topics that should be considered a jumping off point for your further research. We'll start with type and language. It's really important to choose fonts that are accessible in a wide range of sizes and um, in, a, in many different languages. Uh, more and more users are able to test, sorry, more and more uh, users are able to experience games in many different ways, um, from handheld consoles like Switch to giant 4K TVs. When choosing fonts for your game, um, like everything in UI, be ready for every fire that could possibly need to be put out. Here are some ground rules to ensure that your text isn't one of those fires. Um, designing for mobile and designing for 1080p TVs are actually not that different. They have pretty related resolutions and aspect ratios. Um, just like the text needs to be larger on mobile to account for device size, text also needs to be bigger on TV to account for roughly a 10 foot user distance. Therefore, both device extremes still have pretty similar size, text size constraints. Fonts should be no smaller than 28 pixels. Um, that may seem a little bit large, um, especially when designing. It's a, a kind of a tight constraint. However, um, although lots of different guidelines will say, you know, 16 pixels is okay for body type, aiming for 28 is better for accommodating those who may not have 2020 vision. Um, this will make text legible and more comfortable to read for a wider audience and on more devices. In digital media, serif fonts are much more difficult than sans serif to read at small sizes. They add a layer of complexity um, and invite artifacts and blurriness when scaled down. Um, I know as somebody who comes from a graphic design background studying print, you don't get necessarily the same kind of artifacts that you do when scaling down and um, displays have to kind of piece together these serifs with, with pixels. Uh, so a lot of artifacts can kind of come up that way. Display headers have more wiggle room with serifs uh, because they can be displayed at a much larger size and really are only used for one or two words or a few numbers. But most text, especially body text, is more readable when it's sans serif. Um, it's also important to create a hierarchy. Size and prominence indicate what information the user 
should scan to get the most information about what they're looking at. A strong hierarchy helps users find and drill down to the information that they actually need easily and quickly. Some visual elements that you can use to group information and create this hierarchy um, create uh, are con contrast and scale. Um, content that is more stark and larger will be comprehended first. Spacing, repetition, alignment, proximity, all help to group related content and draw connections between the different types of information. Utilizing design principles in a hierarchy will help users to parse information much more easily. Um, so anticipating localization. Localization is the translation of strings into other languages. When designing pages and building containers within them, remember to account for text that may grow longer when it's translated. A static aspect ratio or a shape that doesn't give much room for um, may fit your short English sentence, but when translated into German, like this example shown here, um, it may not fit so well. Allow containers to grow with text ensures that your type won't auto size down to illegible sizes or wrap unpredictably. Uh, which can get a little bit messy. It also leaves room for text sizes to increase should the users need a larger size for legibility. Um, it's also important to test what your game looks like in other languages. If you're in love with a font and you want to use it in your game, just make sure to check that the glyph set uh, supports any non-Latin characters for any languages that you're going to try to support in your game. Google Fonts is a good place to start. It's um, easy to view each of the language glyph sets to see what languages it supports. You may notice the character shown here won't support Chinese, for example. So if you do want to support Asian languages, just make sure you have an alternative font set picked out um, that does support that. Um, oh, so back to you, Justine, for vision. Aha, we're trading off now. <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, so another giant subsect um, of your audience is going to be people with visual impairments. Um, so this can mean a whole slew of things. Um, and it's really important to make sure that when you're designing menus, you're designing workarounds that don't necessarily maybe rely on color or rely on very specific restraints. So as we covered earlier, uh, the amount of people who experience some form of colorblindness is pretty staggering. Um, there's a lot of people that will look at an image that someone without colorblindness sees and have a totally different experience, um, whether that's feeling, storytelling, iconography, anything like that um, can be really impacted by colorblindness. So there are three major types of colorblindness. Uh, they are protonopia, deuteranopia, and tridenopia. Uh, you can see on the right here what a standard wordybib rainbow would look like in the top. And then through these other sections are what people actually experience who have these types of colorblindness. So as you can see, there's a lot of muddiness in between the red and the yellow spectrum, especially. Um, it becomes really difficult then to kind of make these differences between, say, red and green or orange and yellow. Uh, they start to become this, this hue of green. Um, so it's really important to make sure that when you're designing your games, you're making sure you know what the relationship of these colors are and how they'll present to users. So this is an example of a screenshot from Bioshock uh, where you have to unlock this uh, vending machine. So in order to do that, you have to land your little cursor on the green section specifically. Now, for someone without color blindness, okay, that seems pretty obvious. I just have to time it to the section. But then in below, you can actually see what it looks like to someone with red, green color blindness. And now it's suddenly a huge problem. <laughs> Both your red and your greens are the same color of pea green, basically. So it's, it's really hard to pull that out from its intended behavior. Um, so if you were trying to target this, they're nearly identical. Um, you wouldn't be able to move past this point if you had this red, green color blindness. So there's ways that you can work around that. Um, one of the easiest ones is just using non-color indicators. Um, so just making sure that you include something like descriptive text, a unique shape, or a representational icon. Uh, you can see on the right here this brief example of, OK, we spell out a rarity. So if it's a blue level rarity, sometimes blue doesn't exactly show up the correct way. So we can just type rare. Uh, for example, we have a universally accepted sign for don't do this thing. So instead of just using red to say, OK, this isn't allowed, uh, we actually pair it with a uh, shape that is very recognizable that says, we can't do this thing. Uh, the bottom are an example of PlayStation uh, symbols. So not only do each of the buttons have a color assigned to them, they also have a specific shape. Uh, so that way, no matter what, you can still get the intended behavior from these items. 
So this is an example from our game spell break. Uh, all of our outfits have some type of rarity to them. So uh, rare, uncommon, legendary, etc. cetera. Uh, so instead of making just the title, so this character is called the Baron, um, we could have just tinted that orange and said, okay, well, people will be able to tell that by this header, uh, this character is legendary. Unfortunately, for people with colorblindness, that might not always work. So what we did is we supported it with a descriptive text. So it says legendary outfit spelled out and also maps out to the color rarity. So for those who can make those distinctions, they still have that color association, but they also now have a descriptive string to be able to know what that is. Uh, shape is another important one. So this is a GIF from one of uh, the games that I've worked on in the past called Next Up Hero. Uh, it's a very fast paced dungeon crawler uh, where when you die, your corpse stays behind and people can resurrect you to help them fight. Uh, so the idea is kind of like a relay race that you can summon all of these fallen people um, to help you, right? And you can combine them in recipes to summon cooler things to help you. So it's really important to know, okay, I need two of House Alora and two of House Karos and how do you call those out? Um, so we could have stopped with just a colored border around the edges that says, okay, here's a yellow one, here's a green one, here's a blue one. Instead, we paired it with the shape. So each one of these houses has its own shape. Uh, so that way you're able to not only call out the color, but you can also recognize at a glance what house this is based on shape alone. I'm sure many of you have heard of the game Among Us, <laughs> quite popular in the last few months. Uh, this is actually a very new feature to one of their mini games. Um, so during the course of the game, if you are not an imposter, uh, you're expected to be to perform these tasks across the game uh, to make sure that your, your team stays alive. Um, so this one is where you're rewiring a panel and you have to connect one side of the wire to the other side. Uh, prior to this update, they were just colors. Um, so you had a green or a blue, a red, a fuchsia, and a yellow thing. Now, as we saw earlier, if you have color blindness, it might be a little hard to tell apart perhaps the red, the yellow, and the fuchsia, right? So it'd be very difficult for players with color blindness to know what cable they need to connect to what. Um, so they added these little tiny icons here, like a di um, like an X, a circle, a star, just so that folks who might not be able to make that distinction can still finish this mini game successfully. Icons. Um, these are really simple. Um, so these are, you almost always, when you're designing menus, you accommodate for an icon. It just feels like a natural back and forth, uh, but they're actually really helpful. So for example, um, red and green are pretty ubiquitous for good and bad. Uh, stop signs are red, <laughs> you know, green lights are go. Um, so it's very common, uh, but for those with color blindness, it looks like the top two. You can't quite tell the difference between the two of them. Uh, so what we did here is actually, we combined two different things. Not only do we have an icon, check mark for you did it and an X for mm, try again. Um, but we also combined it with a string here. So we actually have descriptive text that tells you, okay, your message went through or your message didn't go through. Uh, so it's really important to design these notifications, especially things that prevent players from continuing to know that it went through or it didn't go through. And it's really easy just to combine that with color, description, and an icon. Color is also helpful when you consider things like contrast. Uh, so for example, this is an entry field example. Um, in the top one, it's kind of hard to figure out what you actually have to use and what you need to interact with, right? Like, where do I type? If you came to a screen and all the boxes are very similar to each other in representation, you wouldn't quite know where to interact. So by including really high contrast, like in the bottom example, uh, you have a very bright field with a very clear text and it's obvious to know, okay, I put my information in this box. Uh, anything that involves your menus, it's really important to make sure that the things that players need to interact with have a very high contrast and that you're able to find them very easily. So one of the coolest things uh, that I, I found when I was researching this presentation um, was there is a blind player that has completely won a tournament in Street Fighter a couple years ago. He goes by the name of Sven uh, as a Dutch player. And it was awesome that a perfectly blind person, you know, can play this game and sufficiently win a tournament, right? Because uh, we, we tend to associate video games as a very visual medium. Um, but by using things like audio cues, for example, uh, he was able to play and compete in the tournament just by sound alone. Um, so this is less pertinent to menus and more pertinent to in-game things, um, but it is still a valuable resource when you're building your menus to have audio feedback. Uh, so players can still go through with a text reader or understand when things go through. Uh, to be able to play your game. Uh, so it's really cool to have, uh, you know, these audio cues that they benefit all players when you're doing uh, your menus in your game. 
So there's a couple of different ways that you can kind of check your design as you're going. Um, obviously, I, I think we left this off on this one, but you know, if you know someone who's colorblind, that's probably the best way to start, right? You have a resource nearby that can help you that might have a certain type of colorblindness that you're able to ask their opinion. That's probably the best way to get research. Um, but if you don't have access to that, uh, you can try colorblind mode in Photoshop. Uh, so the proof settings actually have a drop dropdown uh, that make it really easy to check for, uh, I think it's two types of colorblindness. Um, but you can just pop it through the filter, see how your menus look and see if you need to make any adjustments to size or contrast. There's a bunch of website checkers. Um, so you can actually go to these websites and upload images that show you all of the different types. Um, so that's a great way to pop in your proofs or your mockups and just kind of see if things are trending in the right direction. Uh, alt text is something that's been very popular on Twitter lately, where when you post an image, you also describe the image in alt text. So those with uh, who need speech readers can actually see what's in your image based on a string that you type. So for example, if I was posting this apple, I would say it's a glistening green apple with half of a color blindness mockup, right? So just being as descriptive as possible to show people uh, what, what they would be seeing if they could see it. When in doubt, um, if you need two really high contrasting colors, for example, you have a team and another team and you wanna make sure that no matter who plays your game, it's obvious who's who. Uh, blue and orange tend to be a very, very safe color combo. Um, so as you can see across the major types of color blindness here, they stand out. Maybe in Tridenopia, they're not quite blue and orange anymore, but it's still very obvious to tell which color is which based on their high contrast value. So another section that we're going to cover is hearing. So this covers anybody who may be deaf or hard of hearing, um, who can't quite hear all the cues in your game and how, how to help them through your menus and how to help them through that experience. So obviously the biggest one, and I guess the most obvious one is subtitles. Um, most games nowadays, especially these big open world RPGs have access to subtitles because they're usually very narrative rich. Um, they have a lot of narration and dialogue. Um, and it's really important to make sure that you let users use subtitles when they need them. Um, one of the coolest things is honestly, not only do they help with those who are deaf and hard of hearing, but they also help with non-native speakers. Um, there's a lot of people that have learned other languages playing video games growing up. Uh, so it's really cool to have that on-screen text so that people can read and listen and process through what your dialogue is saying in the game. So this is a really, really cool way to help a bunch of people. This is a tweet I found pretty recently that honestly really surprised me. Um, it kind of shows you that players really use subtitles. Uh, in Far Cry New Dawn, uh, they had them on by default. So you couldn't, you didn't have to go into settings to turn them on. They were just in there already. And 97% of players didn't even turn them off because they liked having them there. They found them useful. They were able to keep up with dialogue. Uh, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey, 95% of players also didn't turn them off. Um, so we see here when they're given the opportunity, people keep them on. Um, I personally play with them and I don't, I don't technically need them, but I love having subtitles just in case a loud car goes by as you just heard someone honking. I live in New York City, so everything is noisy all the time. Um, so it's really great to have uh, subtitles just in case I miss something or I want to make sure that I'm following along with the dialogue. Um, in options, in games where the option is off by default, uh, still 75% of players turn them on at some point. 50% uh, of players are still using them, right? So it's really cool to see how many players actually use subtitles. Uh, and they're pretty low hanging fruit design wise. Uh, it's just showing them up on the screen and is a really beneficial tool. So there's a couple things that you have to think about when you're making subtitles, right? It's not as simple as I'm just gonna put some text here and then people can read it, right? We wanna make sure that we're making the right decisions when you're designing these so that they're actually useful. Uh, one of them is choosing the right font. So Kat just went over a whole slew of things that make for successful display type when you're using your menus, right? You wanna make sure that it's, um, it's legible, you know, it's not super freely, it's a pretty easy display type. Uh, you wanna make sure you're choosing the right color. Some people see white better, some people see yellow better. So when you can, try to let them choose what works the best for them. A legible size. <laughs> Honestly, subtitles should be even bigger than the 28 pixel thing we mentioned. Uh, in television, I believe it's something like 80 pixels wide on the screen. So you wanna make sure, or tall rather. So you wanna make sure that they're a legible size. So if someone's sitting on their couch, you know, they can still read their subtitles and they don't have to squint and try to pick it out over top of the game. Including sound effects and music is really helpful. Uh, so if there's off-screen cues that are relevant to the story or relevant to that dialogue, you know, it's following them out, onomatopoeia, you know, just having them there so players know that things are happening beyond the dialogue is also helpful. And reducing sentence size. 
Uh, so if you paste a whole, a whole anthology on your screen, obviously no one's going to read it because most games are fast paced. There's other things going on that capture your player's attention and you want to make sure that what's on there is very parsable uh, using the right case. So you don't want to have all caps. Uh, it tends to be really difficult for folks just with dyslexia specifically, but also a lot of people have a hard time reading just paragraphs and sentences of all caps. So you want to make sure that you use it sparingly for headers or to emphasize uh, words that you want to be bolded, for example. Um, but usually mixed case is the best option when you're doing that. And showing the speaker. So if you can, especially if you have two characters having a conversation, calling out who's speaking when they're speaking is really helpful. Uh, because if they can't hear the differences in the voices, they're obviously not going to know who's talking. So it's very valuable to make sure that you're calling out the speaker and that people know who's saying what. So this is a screenshot from the game Borderlands 2. Uh, it's very notorious for being a really grungy game overall, right? Like it's a gorgeous art style. It's very comic book, very punchy. But this subtitle is completely lost. <laughs> There's so much going on. It's so textured. Um, the type is really, really narrow. Uh, it can be really hard to see it on the screen. So what exactly went wrong with the subtitle? So first off, the type is really squished together, right? There's almost no kerning. It's very hard to see. All of the words are really, really jammed together just because there's very little spacing here, which makes it hard to read uh, when it's over top of all this busy stuff. It's got really bad spacing between the words even. So everything just kind of runs in together to this really, really squished sausage, and it's impossible to kind of pull it out from the background. There's also no separation from the background. They have a little bit of a drop shadow, a little bit of a stroke over it, but because of how rich the world is, it's still kind of lost. You still don't get to get that impact and that contrast. And they also put way too much text on the screen at one time, especially when you're dealing with a first person shooter and all these monsters are trying to kill you. You don't have time to read a whole, whole huge length, length sentence, right? You wanna make sure that it's actual, it's fast, it's easy to process and you don't have to sit there and read a gigantic story. So here's an example from Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So right away, night and day, um, you can pick this out. It's very legible, it's very clear. So what's great about this? Well, it's high contrast. You have the benefit of, okay, maybe this is a dark scene. So giving them benefit of the doubt, it's in a dark location and they have white text. So of course that's a really high contrast. Uh, there's hierarchy. So the character name is in all caps and the sentence is mixed case. So that way you can pull it out. You know what you have to read and you still get that specification of who's talking. Uh, the back kite is actually um, toggleable. So it's not on by default, but you can go in and change that setting and turn it on to make it even easier to read instead of just the floating text in the background. It uses a legible font. Uh, so it's really easy to read at a glance. And the sentence is really short. He wants to go fishing with the sun. Well, before he kicked him off a cliff. But so it's really easy to see. Um, what makes a successful subtitle when you put all these things together. Uh, end goal is you just want to make sure people can read them and read them quickly. You want them to feel like they're back in the game very fast. So this one starts to lean a little bit away from menus, but I would say it's still kind of part of designing the menu experience, which is having visual cues. Uh, so folks can't necessarily see all the different things in the, uh, in the location. You want to make sure that they're able to navigate the world in the way that you want them to. Uh, so, for example, this is a screenshot from Ghost of Tsushima where there's a lot of scenes where you actually have to climb cliff faces and you have to like navigate nature by grabbing onto these little footholds and ledges. Um, so with this game, they actually mark the ledges of the geography to show you what things you can and can't climb on. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn also did this where they put white paint. So just making sure that if folks have low vision, that they're able to see what they're trying to do when you want them to do it in the world. Uh, so these are really, really helpful to make sure that folks can navigate things. Another version is on-screen indicators. Um, you know, especially if there's things that are happening off screen or might be far away or really difficult to pick out from the background, it's really helpful to have on-screen bright, bold icons to make sure that players know that something needs their attention. So this again is from Ghost of Tsushima and uh, you could get kidnapped villagers and you have to save them before the time runs out, right? So this gives you a sense of urgency because it shows, okay, this person's about to go get them. Here are the people I have to protect. Uh, so it brings your attention back into this really rich world but it makes it much more presentable. So you're able to kind of see what you need to do and when you need to do it. Uh, so, you know, you can add tooltips for off-screen actions or even just in-game events. Uh, if you think someone might not be able to see what's going on, it's always really helpful to have an icon and some kind of alert that draws your attention there. So another big facet is those with motor disabilities. Uh, so this is a really, really pivotal way 
to change how people interact with your game. Um, one of the most easy things that I think most games are starting to move toward uh, is honestly just having controller remapping. Uh, the number one way to make sure that someone can play the game they want to play or they need to play is just making sure that they're able to change the experience to fit them. So an easy way to do this is uh, some of the consoles actually, if not all of the major ones, are actually allowing folks to customize the controller on a system-wide level. So not just in games, right? They can do it for all of their different games uh, where you can change what these different buttons map to, uh, change how the control stick works, et cetera, et cetera. And allowing players to toggle on things like aim assist and low damage um, are things that aren't quite menu-based, but are still really valuable to make sure that folks can play your game without a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, the more you let players customize, the better experiences for them, right? So just allowing them to modify it in a way that makes them feel comfortable is a win in the book. Here's an example from Far Cry New Dawn. This is the ultimate in allowing players to customize, right? So they let you choose what all the different buttons map to. Uh, they let you choose zoom sensitivity, binoculars, everything. And along with that, they also let you customize it for each part of the game. So things like vehicles and helicopters. Uh, they let you kind of go through and modify what all of those control schemes feel like. That's the number one way to make sure players can play the game in the way that they need to play it. So these, <laughs> these are my least favorite parts of games. I get really anxious when I have to deal with anything that has to do with the QTE. So a QTE stands for quick time events. Uh, so these are things that are events within the game that require you to make a split decision or make you do an action really quickly to be able to, for example, break away from danger or escape a precarious scenario, or in this instance, break away from a guy who's trying to stop you from leaving, right? So they can be very, very high pressure for folks without motor disabilities, but for those who can't hit that button repeatedly, that's even worse because now they're stuck in that environment and they aren't able to perform that action that they need to advance the game. Um, you know, so just allowing players to opt out of that is probably the number one way to solve it or just have them do things like Spider-Man where they can just auto-complete them. Uh, so again, it doesn't change the difficulty of the game, just make sure that those who can't hit that repeated action are able to back out of that and actually advance through the game. Because uh, if you hold them back there with this one thing that they can't do, they're not going to be able to finish your game. Um, it's really easy just to allow players to skip through that and be able to play the game as intended. So another important thing to keep in mind is obviously when you're dealing with things cross console, we have a section coming up talking about, you know, how do you design across platforms, right? You know, it's important to think about your keyboard navigation. So you want to design with a controller in mind and you want to make sure that, uh, you know, navigation is easy for people who can't use a mouse. So number one way is just honestly having a virtual keyboard. So these are keyboards that show up on your screen and you can use your mouse and click the keyboard as you would need to do inputs and allowing for quick navigation. So shortcuts that allow you to go between your menus very quickly. So one single button push like M for menu or I for inventory, just to allow players to navigate through uh, your game very quickly and very easily. Uh, you wanna make sure that there's a, the lowest barrier of entry to move between different parts of your game. And uh, pretty related to that actually. Um, so our game Spellbreak came out pretty recently on across cross-platform on many different platforms, um, console, switch, PC. Uh, so there are many different constraints um, for each of those platforms. So how do you design for all of them when you only have one UI? <laughs> um, changing specs. So new technology means that there are new design challenges. Screens are getting larger, people are playing games on a wide spectrum of devices um, and playing cross-platform. Keeping up with the ever-changing tech specs is a constant battle. Um, how do we design for cross-platform play? So this is a screenshot uh, with some color overlays um, from our game Spellbreak. One way that we are dealing with this design challenge of kind of supporting both controller and um, mouse and keyboard, as well as um, like Justine mentioned earlier, for people who can't use mouse and keyboard but are still playing on PC, for example, or, or their consoles, how do we design so that everybody can use the same interactions? Um, consistent, deliberate interaction design uh, we have assigned meaning to each of the axes. So here, the top level navigation moves left to right. Child categories below that move up and down. And grandchildren populate to the right from there. 
Designating an interaction for each level supports usability by giving users a predictable information structure that they can count on. This also ensures that users will be able to interact with a mouse keyboard controller. Um, and remember that any section that you can't get to using this stepping stone method um, will need a clear way to get there when you're on controller. Um, so a face button assignment is a good example of a way to do that. Um, another thing to keep in mind is creating modular assets. So creating flexible UI assets that allow your buttons and menus to scale when your text is longer or shorter, um, or when it increases in size, allowing seamless uh, allows seamless integration of content. Um, here, it's a really helpful tool is if you look into principles of responsive design for web, um, although we're not always designing web games, um, the principles are really similar. Uh, just keeping in mind that containers that house text and um, you know, in this case, uh, this example from Spellbreak has text over overlaying an image. The, the containers that have the text in it should be able to expand vertically or horizontally. Um, consider things like nine slicing uh, to make efficient, easily scaled containers and aligning text to one side and or um, keeping horizontal space open to allow text to get long without running into other lines. Um, a, a big one that I've personally run into is aligning something left and then on the same line, aligning it right. And you know, you localize that text and they run, run straight into each other. Um, but the best possible way to avoid all of these things is to user test your designs. Um, Get your designs in front of users. Uh, the benefits of user testing um, is that you get a better understanding of how players are actually interacting with your game, not just how you hypothesized that they would interact with it. Um, it can confirm what's going well, highlights what can be improved, especially in smoothing out user flows and closing interaction loops. Um, it shows whether the goals of your system are actually being achieved or not and raises design questions that you may not have thought of or that you may have thought were clear, like how to exit a game or how to, how to exit a screen or how to return to the homepage, something like that. Um, and it gives you data as well to support important changes that may have been deprioritized without it, um, including subjective improvements like satisfaction ratings. So when you're running a usability test, um, there, this is a very, very deep topic, uh, so this is barely going to scratch the surf surface, but um, just a, a quick overview. Um, in a usability test, researchers watch how a user interacts with the product to pinpoint areas that aren't user friendly. Um, when you are running a usability test, make sure that you take notes. Um, remain completely neutral if people ask you questions. Try to respond with things like, how do you think it should work? Um, I'm interested to hear what, what you think about this. You can test flows by giving scenarios or tasks, such as um, start from the opening screen and create a guild and watch them as they try to figure out how to do that. Um, you may be very surprised at, at something that you may have thought was a, a clear path to get there is not always so clear to users. It's very humbling. Um, measure performance through success with those tasks that you've given them, uh, measure their timing and how many errors they run into. And also measure subjective metrics to make sure that they're satisfied and um, the dopamine effect is there as it were. Um, and remember to always test. Um, if you can't recruit external participants uh, or you don't have the resources to kind of put together an official user test, Test your designs anyway. Um, it's it's okay to get a little bit scrappy. Find out uh, about usability issues in a live or pre-release game by sending out a survey to your users or testers, um, or even use a pr prototyping prototyping software such as Envision or Adobe XD uh, to create clickable prototypes and pass them out to your coworkers, um, especially people on other teams that aren't related to UI um, who, you know, may not kind of get, may not be picking up what you're putting down in terms of uh, the questions that you're asking them and send out a survey to your coworkers, see how they felt about it, um, see what problems that they ran into while they were trying to use it. Um, and even, even gathering data from your coworkers will still give you 
actionable data. Um, and another way to kind of catch all, solve a lot of the problems we've gone over today um, are just to include custom settings for your users. Um, scalable UI is a good example. This is this is again a screenshot from Spellbreak. Um, so here we allow your HUD to change on this slider. Um, you can make it bigger or smaller. It changes the entire thing, the text, the the keys, everything. Um, allowing users to change the size of type to be readable to them accommodates more users than just choosing one standard size yourself. Changing elements. Changing element sizes too allows usable buttons and icons to be more legible. Um, and if you do include a, a HUD slider like this one, um, it allows users to decide what's the most comfortable for them to look at. Um, another example here from the division two, uh, adjustable contrast. So contrast settings are a great way to not only accommodate different displays that your user might be viewing your game on, but it also helps increase visibility for those who may have low vision. Um, also for all users, uh, I, I personally always hike up my contrast because I just, I don't really like to make my eyes work that much. Um, again, allowing your users to choose what's the most comfortable for them is a great way to go. Um, and another topic I just wanna touch on, this is another one that's very, very deep, but we're just gonna scratch the surface here, um, is epilept epilepsy safety. Um, although they can have many different causes, video game induced seizures, also known as VGS, I was very shocked to find out that, that there's a, a particular um, uh, name for this one type of seizure that is caused by video games. It like kind of struck me a little bit. Um, they can be caused by many different things, but uh, here we're gonna talk about how they're caused by photosensitivity. Um, some triggers, for people who have photosensitivity can include strobing light effects, low frequency TVs and monitor effects, sunlight um, as, it, as like the shafts kind of go through trees can create repetitive patterns that, that sort of uh, mimic this like strobing effect, um, as does light glinting off of windows or water and repeating patterns. For people with photosensitivity and pattern sensitivity, um, consider designing for or including options to eliminate, eliminate flashing effects or blinking animations, um, avoid high risk color combinations. There's a lot of research being done on this currently and um, guidelines that you can reference um, later in this presentation. But um, there's research finding that certain contrasting blues and reds uh, and rapidly alternating between them can be a high risk color combination. Um, reducing, reduce repeating patterns such as stripes. Um, and if you think your game might pose a risk, um, just there are ways that to test it. We also have this in the resources uh, to follow, but just make sure that you include a seizure warning. Um, it's, it's very important for people who at least for the people who already know that they're susceptible to things like this, um, to know that your game might pose a risk to them. And uh, just to kind of wrap up here, um, a couple of additional ways to assist your users um, that we haven't touched on yet are cognitive disabilities like dyslexia, autism, and ADHD. Um, there are ways that you can help people focus on essential elements through reduced distractions and reduced noise. And as well as blind users, um, ensuring that your technology is compatible with screen readers, such as JAWS, VoiceOver, or TalkBack, um, will really help with what Justine was talking about earlier with the alt text, um, helping them to be able to experience your game uh, in, a, in a full way. Um, so again, uh, check out our resources that um, we'll follow with, and uh, you can definitely dive in further with all of the research we haven't touched on here. So just to wrap up really quickly, um, you know, in summary, uh, 
you know, all players benefit from accessible features, right? Uh, not even those who necessarily need them, but all players will benefit from you making the game more accessible, easier to see, easier to read, and easier to hear. So when in doubt, you know, put the player in your play, uh, put the power in your player's hands. Uh, so letting them adjust to their needs and specifications only makes for a stronger game experience. So if you can allow players to change the things that they need to change to be able to use your game, you've already won. And do your research. You know, keep keep testing, keep reading, keep you know, keep iterating, right? There's there's so many things that we're learning every day to make games better for other people that it's okay to keep learning and it's okay if you don't have every answer. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are just the things to get the ball rolling and that there are hours and hours and hours of research you can take um, as you learn and as you design your menus to be more accessible, more usable. And there's always ways to improve. Uh, you don't have to feel bad if you release your game and someone comes to you and says, oh, I can't really see this as a colorblind user. You know, that's a way and opportunity for you to change it to, for the better, right? Like you don't have to feel like you have to have every answer out of the gate, but as you're thinking about these things and moving toward making your game, you're already on a head start. You're already thinking of the players that will need to play your game and to make a better experience for them. So we have some resources here. Hopefully we can distribute the PowerPoint to anyone who'd like to see it. Um, for sake of time, I'm not gonna read through them, uh, but these are some resources that you can check out. Uh, can I Play That is a really cool resource of reviews for folks who have disabilities that rate games. Able Gamers, again, is the charity that does custom controllers for folks with disabilities. Uh, Game Makers Toolkit uh, has a really great video series about making games accessible. There's some guidelines from the Game Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, the web content accessibility guidelines are the same sort of resource, but for using things on the web and software and more information here about seizures. Uh, so again, you can be reading all day long and find tons of things to be able to improve your games and make them more accessible for your users. So that's everything. Yay. <laughs> so hopefully uh, you've gleaned some sort of information here, whether you're new to UI or you've been doing UI a long time, um, just to help you figure out how to let more folks enjoy your games, um, you know, putting the power in your player's hands uh, is the number one way to kind of summarize this. Uh, so I know we had some questions come through. Oh, yep. And we can share out the PowerPoint via email. So if you want to review or click those resources, um, by all means, please th feel free to read through and click through them and uh, hopefully get some more information on that. OK, it looks like we have one question here that came through. Um, are pixel art fonts a big no-no? <laughs> Uh, my answer would be yes and no. Um, if you're in a pixel game, unfortunately, yeah, it probably makes sense to have a pixel type. Um, they are notoriously hard to read sometimes, but there are ones out there that are at least like dyslexic friendly pixel fonts. Um, so if you do research, there are ones that I would say are okay to use if you have to use pixel. Um, but generally, no, they tend to be a little bit difficult because they are smaller, because they're, um, they don't have as much room for that design. So they can be a little bit harder to read. Uh, but there are definitely ways that if you need to use it, you can make it readable. I'm not sure if Kat has a different opinion, but... Yeah, I, I'll just add to that, that um, using it as a header is okay when it's just kind of one or two words and they're really, really big. People don't have as much of an issue with legibility. Um, it's kind of the paragraphs of story text that people put into these fancy fonts that gets a little uh, hairy. <laughs> uh, here's another one here. So let's see. Oh, so I can answer this one really quickly. Have uh, The question is, have either of you worked on a real-time strategy game? If so, what sort of challenges have you faced in that genre? So funny enough, I just finished a RTS game. I've never designed one in my entire life. Uh, I was really scared because <laughs> I had never, I don't really play that genre. Um, obviously there's a lot going on all the time, um, but the game that I worked on uh, was called Transformers Battlegrounds. Uh, and it was actually an RTS targeted to kids, which somehow made it even more difficult um, because obviously when you're designing for kids apps, um, there's a lot of things that you have to keep in mind uh, that are maybe very obvious to gamers that are older, but not necessarily to those who are, say, 12. Um, so I had a really hard time making things that were bold and appealing to kids, but still usable and still presenting all of that information, right? So RTSs have so many rules, so many restrictions, so many abilities that it was really hard to juggle, uh, namely like the ability bar in the lower um, the lower part of the screen. So that we kind of went through a bunch of iterations there to make sure that it was obvious what was happening, you know, how many resources you had left to make that action. Um, so I'd say to like summarize that up, probably your biggest challenge when you're doing an RTS is just making sure that 
the stuff that they need to see is really big and really important and that you introduce a really good hierarchy, especially in your HUD, that kind of filters out the secondary information that they can focus on the game. Because um, there's a lot of steps and there's a lot of complexity. So my recommendation would be wireframe a million times and make sure that you find something that feels good and then send out some screenshots to folks to see which works better and what information they're actually looking at. Because um, that can be a make or break for an RTS specifically. Cool. Um, and there, there's this other question I want to answer as well. Um, can you talk a bit more about responsive design in console or computer games? So I'm going to start by saying I definitely don't know a ton about this because it doesn't work the same way as uh, web, web design, um, which is where I actually started with UI. Um, at least not that I've found. Now I want to do more research on this. Anyway, um, however, I will say that uh, they do have some overlapping principles. Um, I would say that it's really all about anchoring using content size fitters, if you're in Unity anyway, um, and uh, kind of allowing your, your containers to just expand um, rather than having an absolute size if possible. Uh, but really it's just, it's all about anchoring, like just, you know, upper left, lower right, and then any screen size that it's on can just um, keep them where they are, keep them where they're at. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think that's about it. I want to do a lot more research on that. So maybe, they'll, maybe we'll do a talk later. <laughs> yeah, we actually just ran into an issue of, I'm sure folks know, the discrepancy with switch um, and designing for things that are both meant to be used on a handheld device and also on a television. Um, so Kat mentioned earlier that like, yeah, when you're designing for, um, you know, a, a phone versus a, a game, they're not that different, but it can be really hard to make sure that you're making your type large enough. We actually had to go through with spell break and up a lot of the design choices we'd made with font sizes because it was just near unreadable on a switch. Um, so I think we have a unique presentation here now where not only do we have to worry about consoles on a television, but you also have this portable version that can be really hard to see. Um, so we mentioned in the presentation that like one of the biggest things you can do is just try to rely on things that uh, scale natively and make sure that you have um, containers that can expand or grow to accommodate the size that you need. Uh, so anything like nine slicing is something to look at that's really valuable for container size um, and allowing for things to scroll when there's a lot of text and you don't want to sacrifice size. Um, it can be a really big pain point uh, but, you know, if you design your design in the beginning with like that in mind, um, it all comes together at the end when you have to actually port that. Yeah. And also, I believe that there are technically ways, I've been told by engineers, there are technically ways to say if you're on this device, display this. If you're on that device, display that. However, I have yet to have an engineer tell me that <laughs> they have time to do this. So big yeah, caveat like there. I think the dream would be, you know, design a different menu for every console because then you can yeah. make sure that you're optimizing per console. But especially when you work on a small team, you don't always have that liberty. Like a game for like Fortnite, for example, you know, they do have a mobile native menu that's completely different from their PC menu, right? So they had a team that was said, okay, mobile has a lot of challenges with touch and things like that. So we actually have to make our own separate uh, mobile HUD, right? That makes more sense. Minecraft did the same thing as well. So, you know, it's, it's, in an ideal situation, you could, you know, design design much different menus per thing, um, but you don't always have that flexibility, especially when you're on a small team to do that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, there's someone up here. Okay, we got that one. Uh, is 28 pixels minimum type size uh, still the same on even bigger screens? I would say, yeah, I think that's um, that was designed for 1920. So I would just say if you're probably on 4K television, you probably want to double it would be a good safe guess. Um, but, you know, it just depends on the resolution, I guess, you're designing for. But that's more of like a ratio than a specific hard number. Obviously, it's going to scale as your resolution scales up or down. Um, so, you know, look at how 28 pixels looks on your 1920 resolution and then probably double it for when you're designing for a much higher resolution. Um, but it's still gonna take up the same general proportion of your screen, um, which still translate to being able to be seen across the screen or for example, on a 4K monitor. Okay, are there best practices for things like handling large paragraphs of text? For example, letters or books to read in games like Assassin's Creed. Oh, we've definitely come across this a few times. Um, so uh, 
I guess I guess I'm I was going to ask, but instead I'm just going to answer multiple questions in this one. So, um, if if you mean by dealing with like size, um, chunking it up helps a lot. Um, having like a next button at the end so that you can just um, kind of handle maybe one paragraph or uh, a an easily comprehensible amount of text at a time and then just kind of nexting through. Um, a good example is like dialogue in Animal Crossing. I think that they do a pretty good job because I hate reading. Uh, and so I'm just like, next, 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 next. Um, however, if you are talking about type specifically, um, the cleaner the font, the better. Uh, coming from out, out of games and coming into games was a giant culture shock for me. Um, just the types of fonts that that people are okay using here where I, I had been coming from a world where um, Roboto had too much personality to be used in a product. And it was it was really between Lado and Helvetica. Um, so coming to games where we're just like, we're throwing slashes across text, we're doing all caps, we're doing fancy display fonts on everything. Um, you run into these problems a lot. So the cleaner, like crisp sans serif fonts will, um, will work a lot easier for people who have to like read giant paragraphs of text. So if you're if you're trying to accommodate story, that's that's what I would recommend. Okay, and then um, we have a question here. If there are any way we could test our game to make sure it passes the video games Caesar test, there's a link in the presentation uh, that Kat had put in for a website that allows you to test them. So when we send that out in a in an email, uh, you should be able to check it there um, to be able to see if your game passes those restrictions. Um, yeah, and and I will just add a caveat onto that that there are there is still a ton of research being done into this right now, um, as I mentioned in the presentation. So there are a lot of different ways to test, but a lot of these things are are paying attention to other software types. So um, there, if you do some some light googling too, like if that if that resource doesn't work out for for your particular game, um, there are lots of different ways that lots of different people that are putting this to the test to find out if it's safe for for people with epilepsy. Uh, there's one quick one here. Um, are there additional considerations you might add for things in VR? Uh, so VR, um, admittedly, I haven't worked in VR. I'm friends with a few folks that do design UI for it. Um, you have to be a lot more careful when you're doing VR because folks are more susceptible to motion sickness mm -hmm. and things on like the periphery of your vision. Um, so we could probably do a whole presentation on what not to do with a VR game. Um, so that one, you probably want, want to research that a little bit on your own, but I do know uh, you want to make sure that, yes, the general practices are probably still the same, right? You want a good legible type if there is one. You want to make sure you're relying on like color friendly solutions, icons, things like that. So I would say the base rules are the same, um, but there are some VR specific restrictions that we probably didn't cover in this presentation that you might wanna make sure that folks don't get motion sickness or again, epilepsy is probably a much bigger concern with a headset um, where Definitely. you're actually immersed in it as well, right? So Definitely. you wanna make sure that you check those things out um, with someone who is pre preferably designed for VR because um, it could be a really stressful experience for some folks. I think we have time for one more question here. Um, having accessibility at the very beginning. So having had many jobs in the industry, how has including accessibility helped not only the players, but the company themselves? And what has been your experiences with earlier implementation? So obviously like if you have a company that prioritizes these things and changes these things, like of course it's a positive, right? Like folks will feel comfortable using your games in the future. Um, but I will note that it is kind of hard sometimes to advocate for the time to focus on those features. Like mm -hmm. video games specifically are very fast paced. So I think companies are only just now starting to trust people that these are necessary things that we need to consider. Uh, our CEO is actually colorblind. Um, so we have the benefit sometimes of, uh, he actually is one of our field testers, right? It's like he mm -hmm. plays the game and he can actually uh, let us know if things don't read. Uh, obviously and he is very vocal about <laughs> so not every video game company has that benefit, right? So, um, you know, it can be really hard to advocate for resources to do these testing, to do this testing and make sure that folks can be included in the conversation. But I think as the dialogue starts changing and people are being more vocal about uh, things being more accessible, I think it'll help other companies prioritize that and give you time to make those features. Um, and, and if, like, if, if yeah. I could just add to that really quickly, oh, what is that sound? Okay, sorry. <laughs> if I could just add to that really quickly, um, it, there was a, a slide long ago um, where 
the, the contrast between the login inputs. Um, so what I didn't mention is that's a real example from my time working uh, on at in sports betting at DraftKings. Um, I had created a login system where the the contrast wasn't high enough, um, and because people were keeping real money in our site um, and needed to make those transactions, uh, it it ended up actually being a pretty dangerous error. Like people couldn't get in to, to use their own money because um, anybody that couldn't see that very, very faint, I was trying to be all like nice designer, very light gray um, in there, people couldn't see it. Um, and so that was a very early learning, learning um, experience for me that high contrast will still look nice and um, benefits everybody and especially the company too. Yeah, um, so uh, I know we're out of time. So if anyone has any more questions, um, this is my Twitter handle. Feel free to write it down, send me a DM and I can pass it on to Kat if you have any questions for either of us about what you read or any tips for basically anything else. Like I'm happy to answer any of your questions that you have, um, point you to actually more resources if I don't know the answer. Um, but thank you all so much for coming to this talk is Kat's first talk and my second one. So we're definitely learning through things, but thank you for taking the time to come to our presentation and hopefully you learned some helpful things and we got to answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Justin and Kat. It was truly very, very interesting. And uh, 